verse 22, John chapter 10, we continue our course, refreshing our memory just a little bit, ensuring that we're not missing any of the truth that's imparted, keeping in line an idea with the concept here. Now it was, John tells us, writing about Jesus, now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, what do they say? Tell us plainly. We've looked at these verses previously. If you haven't been with us, you can go back and listen to one of those messages. They're available all over the place. But just refreshing ourselves in the context here, we'll cover it quickly. Not a real answer that they're looking for, but this is a setup. It's an ambush, and we know this. What blessed me in considering it again this week was that Jesus walked right into it. He knew full well what was coming, and yet he willingly was ambushed by these creatures that he created. What an encouragement for you and for me. Willfully walking into this setup, this ambush, knowing that they had stones in their pocket. They were ready to go. They wanted him, were encouraging him, enticing him to say something of which they could immediately execute him. And yet he walks right into this, answers them without fear, and in courage gives them the response that they're looking for, and yet they aren't able to touch him. Beautiful, important, powerful for us, right? Uh, you're going to be set up, you're going to be ambushed, you're going to be mocked, you're going to be ridiculed, your faith is going to be called into question, you're going to be challenged. It's not comfortable, right? But God, give us courage. Know that the one, Jesus, has gone before us. He's endured all things, and he's able to, in that moment, you don't need to be necessarily prepared, he told his disciples. For he'll tell you what you need to say in that moment. As difficult as it may be when you're confronted, when you're surrounded, when you're ambushed, and an answer is requested, right? The Lord answers them very straightforwardly, very simply, and again, we've covered this, so we're just skimming the surface. Jesus answered them, I told you already, and you do not believe. It's not new information that they needed, as if they didn't know who he was and what he claimed. It was simply a setup, an ambush. I've already told you, we've already had this talk, and you refuse to accept it, to believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. We've already covered all of this recently, and even as Jesus reminds them of that here. You don't want to follow me. You reject me. You're refusing me, and that's just reality. You've seen the works, and we talked about this last week. It's very important. You've heard my words, and you've seen my works, and you reject all these things. He says, verse 27, my sheep, and we've talked a lot about shepherding recently, right? My sheep hear my voice, and they respond. They follow. I know them. They follow me. You don't want to do that. That's why you're not of my fold. I give them, and this was key, this was huge last Sunday, wasn't it? I give them eternal life, and they shall what? Never perish. It's a gift that's given. It can't be taken away. It can't be undone. No one can snatch you, take you from the fold of God. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Our salvation is based on the finished work of Jesus Christ, not on your good works. And I pray that that grace is a message that's more, wow, evenly spread out in the body of Christ, because how many come each and every week to a church on a Sunday morning and think that there's still work left to be done because I haven't been good, God's not pleased with me, and thus I need to spend some time kind of earning and working my way back. It's not how this works. It's a gift that has either been given or it has not. You've either received it or you have not, right? And though we are often faithless, he remains faithful right? We'll talk about that a little more this morning. 
Jesus says, verse 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. A quality, a quantity, it's eternal life. It's what it's like to know God through Jesus Christ. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, he says, who has given them to me is greater than all. Can you say those three words, greater than all? It's just so much fun to remember how big our God is. No one badder, no one bigger, no one better. That's who we're privileged to come to, to run to, and it's important that our God be that great, that strong, and that mighty. Because many will come and knock on your door. Try to intimidate and ambush and so on and so forth. But even Jesus says it here, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And he says all this for a reason. Here's our answer, and we'll see the response. I and my Father are what? One. And we talked about that last time, how essential, how important this is. They got what he was saying. They understood without question because, again, then the stones come out and they're ready to go. This is what they wanted to hear. They weren't able to do what they wanted to do, but this is exactly what they were hoping to hear. In their mind, it was cause to kill him. That he, as we'll see shortly, being a man, and there's no question that Jesus was a man, claimed to be God, and yet he was also God. Very clear, very direct, courageously just simply speaking the truth of the word right? Not intimidated, not panicking, not running, but just simply speaking the truth. A pillar on which the church and the Christian life is built, a concept. We sang about it this morning, coincidentally. Did you catch it? How Jesus, without question, Jesus is God. No question. It's a truth. It's a pillar it's a foundation of our faith on which we're built, and we must never give it up. There can be disagreement. We pray that it's peaceable disagreement, but this is an issue that we will never forsake, never give up. Because if we give up the deity of Jesus Christ, that he is fully God and fully man, we have no faith, no foundation on which to stand. It's not just a good man who could do some good works and then take the sin of the world upon himself and pay its price and come back. We've talked about that. Jesus said last week, I'm going to lay my life down and I'm going to take it back up again because I can do that. No one takes it from me. I lay it down and I have power, verse 18, to take it back up again because I am God. I and my Father are one. Never question, never doubt. It's uh, black and white, and of course, if you have the words of Christ in red, we love that too. Never question, never miss, never give up. This, of many, these pillars of the faith, with it, we're secure. Without it, apart from it, we have no faith. Salvation doesn't stick unless Jesus is God. Amen? Amen essential and important, without question, seen in the Scripture, their response, their reaction confirms what Jesus was communicating, right? And either he's lying, as we said, and thus not someone we should listen to, or he's the Lord, and he's demonstrated his deity. Then the Jews, verse 31, took up stones again to stone him, Jesus answered them, many good works I've shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? They had always sought to find some kind of accusation against him, some evil of which they could accuse him, but they could not ever find a single thing. The perfect life of the God-man, Jesus Christ. No one of us, not one of us can claim this kind of perfection, but he's demonstrated it being a pure, spotless lamb, sinless, slain before the foundation of the world, right? The only sacrifice acceptable to God. Not you, not me, not any of us, not all of us put together. There's none righteous, no, not one. Couldn't find a single thing 
A single person to step forward, right? No, no sex scandals. That's the thing these days, and it's just coming out and continuing to come out. And I think there's a couple sides to that, right? There's the false accusation, and there's the real deal. But these are huge issues in the world right now, even in the church. It's not good. You'll never hear of that kind of accusation coming against Jesus Christ. Not one will stick. Because he's sinless, because he's perfect. What good work. Why do you want to stone me, he says here. And they make it clear, not because of his works, because he heals the lame and opens the eyes of the blind. Shortly, we're going to see, raises the dead and the especially dead, the, the really dead, the four-day dead. Amen? You read ahead. You know where we're going, right? Your words, they say here are the problem. The Jews answered him, verse 33, saying, for a good work we do not stone you. We don't have a problem with your works. But for blasphemy, because you being a what? Man, make yourself God. It's as if they're being set up and they're testifying the truth, even though they reject it and refuse to believe it. No question Jesus is fully man. No question. He can't represent us if he's not one of us, and yet his deity is demonstrated through his, primarily, his death and resurrection. I am, we're going to read shortly, the resurrection and the life. Not, I have the ability to, but I am itself life and death. The resurrection and the life. This is the one that we're dealing with here. And this is a credible claim if you can back it up. Anybody can say it, but can you demonstrate it? Only Jesus has been able to do that. Prove it without question. You claim to be a man, you are a man. But you make yourself equal to God. Deity. One with the Father. Jesus answers this issue. He poses a curveball kind of question. And if you read this over the past couple weeks and were a bit confused, God bless you. Because it is a little confusing. That's why we study the scriptures. Amen. Firstly, understand Jesus is throwing them a bit of a curveball that comes from the Scripture. And the idea is, as we'll read shortly, well, let's just read it and then we'll cover it. How about that? Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, that is the Old Testament Scriptures? Psalm, write it down, Psalm 82, verse 6. Is it not written in your law? This concept is imparted of humanity and deity. The concept of a God-man, as it were. Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? Now Jesus gives this commentary, stay with me. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and as we all agree together, what? The scripture cannot be broken, do you say of me, whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not do, listen, this is the key that unlocks this question, this curveball that he throws him here. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, Believe the works that you may know, and what? Believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. Uh, that I am one with the Father, that I am God, that I've come to save you from your sin. So he quotes this verse. He pulls from the Old Testament. The statement that he makes is profound, and we should give some attention to it. If the Scripture says this, and the Scripture cannot be, what? Broken. You take it all, or you reject it all. There's no parts and pieces, and I like this, but I'm not so sure about that. Either it is the Word of God, or it's not. We're all in, or we're out, right? Just as with Jesus Christ. It's not, well, he's a good teacher and a prophet, and he did some good things. He's a humanitarian and a miracle worker, and I really like him over here, and I don't really care for him and what he has to say about looking at a woman and lusting after her in her heart. I'm not so sure about that stuff over there. We're all in. He's Lord or not, right? 
And so it is with the Scripture. And I appreciate the positioning of this statement. This is a tough verse, Psalm 82, verse 6. You've got to dig in a bit. You've got to study. You've got to look into the concepts, the metaphor, as it were, the idea that's being communicated here. There's going to be a lot when it comes to the Word of God, the Scripture, that we don't understand. we got to earn it. we got to work for it in the sense that we're studying to show ourselves approved, right? Rightly dividing the Word of God. There are some things that require a little more digging, a little more studying to understand. But listen, there are some things we're just never going to understand. How God can be 100% God and 100% man, I still can't understand that. But we see it without question. And we'll either receive it or reject it. We believe it by faith, right? That's what Jesus says in verse 38. But if I do, though you do not believe me, look at what you're seeing. The ultimate sign of one coming back from the dead by his own power. Believe the works if you don't believe me, right? There's an ingredient here, an element called faith. Some things we're going to see it and we're going to say, yes, I get it. Some require a little more digging, a little more studying. You look into the linguistics and so on, the culture, the history. But there are some concepts imparted here that are just above our pay grade, beyond our understanding that we're just going to have to accept to believe by faith until we see the Lord face to face, face, then he'll say, well, this is the answer, and we'll say, okay, now let's move on. Amen? The scripture cannot be broken. So Jesus challenges them here, as again, we're talking about the combination of humanity and deity, right? Fully man, fully God. It's kind of seen here. The Lord is posing this idea to them out of Psalms 82, verse 6. Is it not written, and we're reading Psalm 82, 6 now, I said, <clears throat> pardon me, I said you are gods. The word in the Hebrews, Elohim, it doesn't always mean the one true and only, absolutely God. But it can mean judges, and that's the usage of it here. These who have the ability to pronounce life or death, guilty or innocent. That's a lot of power. This word is applied to them. It's not saying that men like us can become or are gods in any way. But nonetheless, the word is used. These who claim to be the foremost students of the scripture, Jesus is challenging them here. If he called them gods, verse 35, to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him? Whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. Again, here's the statement that unlocks this curveball, and it is, amen? If I do not fit the bill, right? Don't believe. If I do not do the works of my Father, represent Him perfectly. I can say I and the Father are one because I reflect that in my integrity, in my character, in the power that I've received from God to raise a dude really, really dead, to call him out of the grave and he'll come, to go into it myself and three days later come back. If I don't do the works, then don't believe, but if I do, right? Come on, guys, he says to them here. The concept's there. The idea, even metaphorically, is seen in the Scripture. If I do, and this is huge, right? Though you do not believe me, this statement just causes me to cock my head a little bit and scratch my, my head. If, he says, I do, though you do not believe me, my words, believe the works, the foremost sign that he would show, that you may know and believe that the Father's in me, and I in him. If you just have issue with me, and you can say this in your personal ministry, I don't know what your issue is, if it's with me, but consider who the Lord is and what he's done. Consider the works, Jesus says, and believe that the Father's in me and I in him. Of course, because they had no desire to listen to him, receive from him. Verse 39, you with me? Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he what? walked right through him. He escaped out of their hand. 
Couldn't touch him because it wasn't time. And so we continue to read. Verse 40, he went away again. Beyond the Jordan to the place where John, that is the Baptist, was baptizing at first. And there he stayed. Then many came to him and said, John performed, that is John the Baptist, performed no sign, no miracle, no wonder. But all the things that John spoke about this man were true. And what? Many believed in him there. As these guys had made their choice, rejected, refused the simple word that he spoke, Jesus went away to those who would listen, those who would receive. And I appreciate that here. The place that he went, if you have a Bible, or pardon me, a map in the back of your Bible, you'll see that Jesus went eastward across the Jordan to this area, this region of Perea, and this is where John the Baptist for mostly engaged in his ministry, baptizing there. Many came out to see John there in the wilderness. Jesus was baptized by John, special day, the beginning of our Lord's ministry, wherein the, the voice of God the Father said, uh, well done, pardon me, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, listen to him. And the testimonies given here at the beginning of the Gospel of John, the Holy Spirit comes down in the form of, of a dove and, and rests upon him, a momentous occasion. Our Lord is baptized, seemingly or symbolically filled with the Holy Spirit, and he goes out in public ministry at this point, revealing himself to be Messiah to his people. John's work was really, really simple, wasn't it? And we read about that ahead of time before John the Baptist ever came on the scene to make straight the way of the Lord or to prepare a people for the Lord. More simply, to point every person to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, that God said he would send. And what's John's testimony? Behold, right, we've covered this. We've studied that. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Doesn't cover it up. Doesn't overlook it sweep it under the rug, but takes it away, renders us clean, washes us as white as snow. Behold, there he is, John said, of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What's John's testimony? You're reading about it here. His legacy. It's fantastic. It's amazing. His life culminated in many people coming to Christ, right? But what did his life kind of look like? Started well, ended a little, a little rough, right? If you know your Bible. He was arrested, and he stayed in jail until he was beheaded. Such is the life of a prophet. Who wants to sign up? Many say they do, but when it comes to the real deal, right, it's, it's quite different. But what's the fruit of his life? What did it all accomplish? Quite a bit. We see the fulfillment of all that here. This is a guy, he performed no sign, no miracle, no wonder, and that's recorded right here in the Bible, and the scripture can't be broken. And yet look at the fruit of his life. We are a people so prone to the fantastic and signs and wonders and miracles, how we feel and what we see but here, this seems to be the real deal and nothing showy about it. Frankly, a pretty simple life. Just a man who constantly testified about who Jesus is, right? And many people, verse 42, many believed in him because of that testimony. He did no sign, but he talked a lot about Jesus. Many people come to faith. It's right in line with what the New Testament teaches, right? God has chosen the weak and foolish things of this world to confound the wise. What does that mean? That we're all a bunch of dummies or... No, that's not what it's referring to at all. It's that God chooses to use people, Second Chronicles, with loyal hearts who move out in simplicity live a sincere life, and just kind of talk about Jesus, right? Pointing people to him. It's not the big fancy thing and the show and the 
all the rest, if I could only be weird enough to gain an audience by putting on a show, then I could. No, that's not the way of the Lord, is it? It's simplicity. It's just naturally supernatural in this way. I think we could say a lot about this and we should give some time to consider it, right? How many of us say to ourselves, well, the Lord could never work that out through me or do this in my life? How many are going to come to Jesus through me? I mean, come on. I've never done a sign, a wonder, a miracle. My hand never shook, and I didn't like go, and threw my jacket out over the audience, and everybody bowls over like stinking bowling pins or something. I never got all super weird and stomped around on the stage. Well, because, you know, it's not in the Bible. Actually, it is, and it's like the prophets of Baal, amen? But I digress. You with me? The Lord could never. What if all of us said the Lord could do that, exactly that, through me? It's simplicity. It's, it's being sincere. It's just living a life, a simple, natural life. That's what John did. He just talked about Jesus. Pointed people to him. And now the Lord swoops in and all these people are just collected, as it were. Being prepared, coming to faith, seeing Jesus and saying yes. Right? The simple, simple life. None of us. Have we ever done a miracle, a sign, a wonder? But all of us can have this simple testimony here. And what if we took that up? And what if we made that ours? And what if we went into our week and said, I can do that. Show me the details, Lord. Teach me. Lead me, Holy Spirit, in what you have for me. He'll take us in different directions. It'll look a little bit different for each of us, but the Lord will accomplish the same end when we simply say, here am I, send me. Lord, what can you do? Simply, naturally, through my life. All of us can do this. And God help all of us to do this. It's not the song and dance. Boy, you don't have to walk with the Lord for very long to discover that, right? Because it's fake. It's not real. It's the simple, consistent life, isn't it? Faithfulness demonstrated over decades of time. A consistent witness and testimony. Boy, we could go on and on. Can you amen all that? What a glorious testimony. Though John endured some difficulty and he spent his last days in a dungeon and was beheaded. What a glorious testimony. What are we working toward? What weight of glory what will be your story? Many believed in Jesus there. That's his, and it's glorious. What is this life but an opportunity? Amen? Well, verse 1, chapter 11, we move into a new chapter and we transition into a different story, and you'll only discover that in an expositional study. Some say you should never do it, but we're going to do it this morning. In everything we do in every way, we try to give attention to the Word of God. So, we move into chapter 11. I pray you read ahead. This is a, well, it's just an incredible story, isn't it? About a precious family enduring, dealing with sickness and, and sadness, and we can see how the Lord speaks to it, works through it in profound ways. There are those, if you'll take a few notes this morning, who teach and who say confidently that if you're a Christian, as a Christian, you'll never have to deal with, endure, encounter, sickness, death, so on and so forth. If you just have enough faith, they'll say. You'll never be jobless and homeless and you'll never get sick and die and all these things. And they stand in front of congregations and they speak these words, mainly on television before a big audience and dial now and all these kinds of things. Well, Tell that to John the Baptist, who, you know, served the Lord faithfully, arrested, thrown in a dungeon, was beheaded. How's that work? Tell that to Paul the Apostle, right? Who we read, even Paul the Apostle, the guy who healed countless individuals miraculously, his handkerchiefs and aprons were laid on people and they were healed. 
Who's got that going on? Right? And yet, Paul the Apostle pleaded with the Lord concerning this serious physical ailment that he had. And we're not talking like stubbed toes and sore, achy joints. Right? The language, the Greek, alludes to the fact that this is a debilitating, serious deal. And there are some hints given, but we're not told exactly what it was. The Lord won't divulge your medical records. Kind of a joke. It fell flat, obviously. But it's kept private. God's a gentleman. The Holy Spirit's a gentleman. See, saved it. Doesn't tell all your secrets. So we don't know what it was, but the language reveals to us that it's pretty, pretty serious, right? It plagued him. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you can read all about that. I pray you do. Uh, Paul shares with us that he pleaded, he begged God to heal him. And God said, no. This is Paul the Apostle. How many churches did he plant? How many miracles did he do? How many people came to Christ through him? Paul the Apostle, right? Saw a vision of, of heaven and talked about it very, very subtly, briefly. Paul the Apostle. God didn't heal him, but God spoke a wonderful word to him. And what if Paul was not allowed to go through the difficulty that he did? We'd not have the word that we do. Paul begged God to heal him. God said no, but God spoke to him. And it's a word that has ministered to millions of Christians since God spoke it. What kind of price tag can you put on that? Just one verse, one statement. Uh, uh, he said to me, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. I'm not going to heal you physically, but I'm going to bless your socks off ultimately. Work through you in ways that are far beyond your ability, anything you could hope or dream of. I will sustain you. I will be with you. My power is made most manifest or seen the most clearly through physical infirmity or weakness, inability. Not the best of the best and the brightest that the world can train up and offer. That's not who I use, God says and confirms here. But I'm going to allow you to struggle and have a hard time and deal with the, the real issues of life like sickness and death because through you I can work out a, a greater weight of glory, right? Reveal myself more clearly to the world and isn't that the whole point? What if God didn't allow this to continue? We'd never know the truth that Paul has to speak and share concerning all these things. That's powerful. So too, the story we're about to get into, and we're introducing this story and taking some time today, it'll take a few weeks, no doubt, because of the depth, the weight that's here. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me. Did you read ahead? Wow. Do you believe this? And then he calls Lazarus out of the tomb. Profound, powerful. What if this did not exist? What if all this did not occur? We not have those words that Jesus spoke. You couldn't call on those words. And that's the most popular, by the way, memorial funeral text there is in the Bible. Because it's radical. He who believes in me will never die. What if we didn't have that in the Bible? It comes through sickness. It comes through suffering. Two things. Two things God wants to do through any season of suffering we might go through. The Bible's really, really clear in regard to sickness, death, suffering. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, right? Going to have problems that other people are going to send our way. Never promised to be spared from these things. But in reality, we just might experience them more than the rest. Why? Because God works in us and through us in extraordinary ways if we allow him to. Two things God wants as we work our way through any season of suffering. He wants to work through us 
that is, as a witness to others. He wants to work through us as a witness to others. How many verses do we read that reflect that reality? As James says, count it all joy. When you go through the worst times that life has to offer. What? Who can do that? Nobody except a Christian. One who's filled with and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. One who has a Bible and can read about John the Baptist and Mary and Martha and Paul the Apostle and say, wow, I'm in good company, right? Suffering, sickness, death, just like Jesus demonstrates. And look what the, wait, I think I'm up for that. I can do that. Lord, help me. But that's what I want. The Lord wants to work through us as a witness to others. And he will if we can say in that moment when those dark times come, we can say simply, honestly, yeah, this stinks. I'm not going to get all Christianese and be all weird. This stinks. This hurts. This is tough. But it doesn't change the truth of God's word. It doesn't change who he is and what he's done and what he's got coming. It's not going to divert me from the course that he's set me on. I will not curse God and die. That's a witness. Signs, wonders, come on. That's at the top of the list, folks, right? The world looks on and they say, what? Joy? Peace? I I don't get that. I don't understand this. As we're honest, as we share how we feel, and I think that's important, but then we share the hope that we have in God. The Lord firstly wants to work through us as a witness to others. Just might be the greatest form of ministry you'll ever have. Secondly, the Lord firstly wants to work through us, but secondly, he wants to whisper to us. And this is that point in regard to the wonderful things that God shares when we're in that season of sickness or suffering, like he does to Mary and Martha here. If Lazarus did not die, we'd never have this word. If Paul didn't go through all that he did, we'd never have that concept, this teaching, those verses. We wouldn't have it. It wouldn't be in the Bible. If he said no, or whatever, took his own life, or any number of things, right? God wants to whisper wonderful, priceless, and powerful words to you. If we'll listen, if we'll say, okay, Lord, this is not pleasant, but... Blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives and takes away, right? But what's that concept we pull from Job? A guy who suffered more than all of us ever put together, right? And didn't know why until the end. Blessed be the name of the Lord, right? What am I going to say? Though he slay me, yet I'll serve him still. All that and so much more. It's essential, it's important, and it's seen in this text that sits before us. And so... As it comes to sickness and death and suffering, let's see how the Lord deals with it. There's a lot here. Can you amen all that? Take a deep breath, and I'll try not to teach for another two and a half hours. I promise. Pastors shouldn't lie. Verse 1, chapter 11. Now a certain man was sick, and we're going to focus in uh, with a sniper scope on this man, this family. A certain man was sick. Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary. So special recognition, attention is given to these guys, and we'll see why. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother, Lazarus, was sick. This is a family that was special significance to the significant to the Lord to his disciples he would often stay in this home as he passed through Bethany uh, they came to be very dear to him we often see them there a couple of passages you can reference firstly Luke chapter 10 is where we see Jesus passing through and that's the story you probably heard it before where Jesus is teaching and Mary sitting at Jesus's feet just yeah taking it in like hopefully we are in some ways now Lazarus is there listening. Martha's distracted and busy and serving, and she comes to the Lord complaining, right? Tell Mary to get up and, you know, help me because there's a lot of housework to do, and 
for all these people, all the things and food and cleaning and so on and so forth. And Jesus says, come on, you should be sitting with her. There's a time for service and there's a time for sitting at the Lord's feet. Both are important. And yet this is the time to be sitting at the Lord's feet. So just tune all that other stuff out and sit and listen. Receive from me. Hear my word. Spend some time in fellowship with me. There's a time for both. Get up before the kids do, parents. Good luck when they're up, right? And don't say to them when they're up and screaming and yelling, there's a time to sit at the feet of the Lord religiously. Don't do that. Just realize your time's over, right? And it's Martha time. Amen. You're going to read in this passage, this is important, that the Lord loved Martha. This Martha and this Martha, right? The Lord loves Marthas, those who work and get stuff done. Pray for discernment, right? When to be a Mary when to be a Martha. There might be a Lazarus here too, and you might be dead, and I don't know, maybe you'll come back. Maybe you'll wake up. But at the very least, we read about this family there, right? Listening, learning, growing, just like all of us. Matthew 26 is the account that's referenced here. You can read that this week, where Mary, who sat at the feet of Jesus, as Jesus told his disciples and prepared them, I'm going to Jerusalem to die, to be crucified. And his disciples are like, sweet Lord. All right, cool. What's next? They missed it. They weren't listening. They didn't get it. And we see that. But Mary did, and so she gave her dowry, this expensive perfume, the most priceless possession she had, and she gave it to the Lord and anointed him for his death and burial, right? And it's a fantastic story. We love that. We learn what worship is there. We learn what giving is there. And so on and so forth. Matthew chapter 26. So it was this family. Special attention is given to them here because it's important. It was that Mary, that Martha, that Lazarus. Therefore, he gets sick, right? And it's serious. Jesus often passes through, but this is the real deal. So they sent to him. I love this. It seems simple, right? But oftentimes in life, we forget the small stuff, the simple things, and we miss out. Lazarus is sick, and thus they sent for Jesus, saying, it's real short, real sweet, Lord, behold, he whom you, what? Love is sick. He whom you love is sick. Beautiful, powerful, short, sweet, really important. Firstly, we've seen and we've discussed that sickness is a part of life, right? It hits houses like these. We, the place where Jesus spent time and laid his head and he hung out, I mean, really not that house, not those kind of people, yeah, all of us. Sickness and death are a part of life, and I think we need to demystify that these days. There's not necessarily a cosmic significance behind sickness and death. For the most part, we just need to realize that it's the product of living in a sinful world. It stinks. Somebody told me after, uh, before this service, death hit their house uh, this last week. I shared last week about another friend. Death hit his son. Uh, This is the real deal, and these are issues of life. It doesn't necessarily mean that God is behind it. It does not mean that God sent it, but it's a byproduct of living in this world. And the more real or or honest we are about that, I think the better. We look for this cosmic, mystical, spiritual significance sometimes, and there's reasons for that. But biblically, primarily, we do not find them. There are a couple exceptions to this general rule. And that's true. Job's one of them, right? Satan wanted to. God said, okay. That's an important story that teaches us a lot. And yet with most of us, when sickness, when death strikes, when it comes, it's just a part of life, guys. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're cursed cosmically, that God's mad at you spiritually. If something's wrong, and you're a child of God, he's going to tell you what that is because he's faithful, right? 
And so when these things come, and they come, how many friends and pastors and spiritual leaders, this stuff hits everybody. There are some exceptions, consequences. We're not talking about that. Consequences for sin. That's not what we're discussing. That's pretty simple to figure out, right? Talking about just general sickness and death. It's just a part of life. But what do they do? That's the thing. It's not why, 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 which is what we do. It's who. They send word to Jesus. That's what we do as Christians, as children of the living God. We send word. We start praying. What's going on, Lord? What should I do? What can you do? We get other churches and friends and everybody starts praying. We send word to the Lord, right? That's what they do. That's essential for us. What a privilege we have to send word to Jesus Christ. To say what these guys did. And we'll wrap it up here. Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Not Lord, the one who loves you the most or the one that you owe a lot to. After all, we've done some work for you, God. Nothing about themselves, what they are, what they do, what they will do. Oh, God, if you just, and and all the rest. But this is the highest form of, of relation. It's not our love for God. It's his love for us, right? That's the key. Lord, the one that you love is sick. That they could express that, right? And that the Lord would receive that is profound. Behold, he whom you love, it come quick, Lord. The one that you love is sick. You love us, and thus you will surely help us. That is the heart of God. Misconstrued in many ways these days, I think. The fact that we're encouraged, if not commanded, in the scriptures to send word to the Lord, to start praying. We have a national day of prayer, for goodness sake. Man, talk about sending word to the Lord. National day of prayer. And recognizing all that's going on in our country, especially like right now, we're praying for unity. God, get us straight, because we're all whacked out, right? Find a way to bless this mess, all of us, and do what you do, right? That's what needs to happen. Not the world, and it ain't the devil. If we, the church, Christians, man, could figure a few things out, make the priority of our lives a singular one. Sending word to Jesus. I love the book of Hebrews. Love how it paints a picture that's very important as that Jesus is our great high priest. He's the one you go to. He's the one you can send word to. He's gone through it all so he's able to relate to you, minister to you. He's there to pray for you to the Father. That's crazy, right? Jesus would pray for you to the Father. Chapter 4, book of Hebrews, is especially essential. Uh, There we're reminded that we can come boldly to the throne of grace and find strength and help in time of need. Come boldly, boldly. I'm going right to the Lord. I'm sending word right away to Jesus. Don't have to jump through hoops or like put on a song or dance or give something quickly and karmically kind of balance things out. I can run right up to the Lord. If you watch like my my eight-year-old, He'll like pop in those doors after the service. He doesn't care. He'll run right up here. Even if we were on service right now, he'll just run right up front and just, I'm here. That's what we get to do. Boldly to a throne of grace. Now, it's many things. But for you, it's a throne of grace by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have access. Grace covers you. It's sustaining you, continually keeping you as a Christian in a right relationship with God. It never changes. It's fixed in the heavens. So God's favor as he looks on you never changes. It's not up one day and down that, man, I'm so bummed out with you right now. Nope. 
Never happens. What access we have, God help us to come. The first thing they do, not sackcloth and ashes, you with me? Not a pity party. They don't euthanize themselves or medically whatever. They send word to Jesus, right? Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. God, help us to relate to him a little more like these do here. The Lord responds, and as you're going to see, boy, it's not quite the response or the reaction that we might think, but the Lord's got a wonderful story in store for you, and I look forward to it. Amen? Here's what he says, and we'll close. When Jesus heard that, he said what? Yes! Okay, that's the ACH translation. It's not there. But that's kind of what I picture here. He said, I imagine with a little positivity, can we say that? Is that too liberal? Excitement? I don't know. But he says, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God, what? May be glorified through it. Yes! This is going to be an opportunity, he says here, and it is. Not unto death. Yes, it is. Wait a minute. Lazarus is going to die. And yet that's the mystery, isn't it? Uh